there, uh, is there, there is a change for my slides. Okay, thank you. Perfect. It's already loaded. It's, yeah. Perfect. Yes. Thank you very much. Welcome to what is going to be a very exciting and interesting ESOF 2020 session on two different but sort of intermingled um, aspects of research into COVID-19. You'll see shortly. We're going to play two videos from our remote um, participants. Um, Thomas Hartung at Johns Hopkins University in the US, who's got up very early for the occasion, and David O'Reilly um, 
who's the scientific director of British American Tobacco, and you'll see why he, tobacco is important here. And beside me, I'm happy to have in the room David Buds Peterson, Professor Peterson from Copenhagen, from Aalborg University, and he'll res respond after we've seen the videos. So could we please have um, Thomas Hartung's video now? Hello, I'm Clive Cookson, science editor at the Financial Times, talking down the line from London, the Thames behind me, to Professor Thomas Hartung at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland. Uh, welcome, Thomas. Hello, Clive. Uh, hello from Baltimore. You are one of tens of thousands of scientists who have switched attention from other research during this pandemic to COVID-19. In particular, you have been working with your mini brains, tiny balls of neurons, to see various effects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus on brains, on the human brain and the nervous system. Tell us how far you've got with that work, Thomas. Sure, we are part of the scientific gold rush at Klondike, <laughs> which is taking place at the moment. <clears throat> it didn't come for us um, as, uh, say, distant as, uh, as, as it might sound, as we are normally looking at the chemical effects on, on small brain structures. Uh, we have been working on different virus infections in this model, so it lended itself really to, to do this. Uh, you have to understand uh, the brain, our most precious organ. Um, it's very difficult to study. Uh, nobody will give you a part of its, his brain. Uh, so it's necessary to find models of the human brain, especially if you're talking about virus infections, which are human-specific. Um, so we had some breakthrough developments uh, some four years ago uh, that we can actually use stem cells, which come from human skin, uh, which has been reprogrammed to form mini-brains thousands of mini brains and, and these structures allow us um, to test the effects of viruses or of chemicals. Um, so it came natural to say this is the human model to test whether this uh, virus can also affect the brain. Tell us about the size and shape of your mini brains and how similar are they to tiny human brains? I would say they are compromised between complexity and uh, easiness of standardization and mass production. Um, so they reflect the development of, let's say, the first month, of, uh, of the um, first five months of, of, of brain development. They just have the size of uh, one third of a millimeter. So that's the, about the size of an eye of a house fly. So that, which means you can just see them, which just comes in very handy. You can take them and move them. Um, but they're also um, small enough um, but you can produce tons of these and um, we have uh, the opportunity to test many, many concentrations of the substance, numbers of viruses, stop at diff very different times and, and do our analysis. What happened when you infected them with the SARS-CoV-2 virus and how did you do that? I mean, we, we really hope that uh, nothing would happen uh, because this would be the best for mankind. Um, because uh, um, a virus which goes in the brain, we call this neurotropism, uh, that's a nasty thing. Um, and uh, what we did is we used a virus containing um, fluid, uh, so cells which were infected, which did produce this virus, and we contacted in very small numbers the virus with our mini And then 
we actually found it. Um, there's brain cells which clearly take up the virus. The virus multiplies a hundred, a thousand fold in these cells and they appear to lyse these cells and start to infect them. So there's an infection set. Uh, and that's very worrying um, because it means if the virus gets into the brain, it can propagate or could possibly even persist in, in, in the brain. Is that an expected result? Do these cells have the ACE2 receptor that the virus supposedly uses most frequently to get into human cells? Yeah, this was actually part of our investigations. There was already some um, hints in the literature that ACE2 could be in the brain. And it looked bit controversial, um, but we found it. We found it not only in our brain cells, um, but we also found it in the very early cell forms, we call them neuroprecursor cells, um, to, which form, form in the brain. So there's really a big concern that also the developing brain could be infected. Um, we did not find the uh, classical co-receptor, um, the TNP receptor, uh, but probably it's other proteases like purine, which are doing the job. What do you think the implications are for COVID-19 in people, and in particular for the likely effects of the virus on the brains and nervous systems of people? I mean, first of all, it is adding uh, bad news to a pile of bad news with this virus. So, um, it is getting more and more complex what it can do. And uh, what was observed, which prompted our, our, our research was uh, very many patients develop neurological symptoms. Um, already in Wuhan in February there was reports that about 36% of the patients showed problems and they could now possibly be explained in part by direct infection of these type of cells. Um, other studies from Europe even suggest 50% and more have some symptoms uh, which are neurologic. Um, but there's now also um, a possible awareness that this virus might be much more difficult to eradicate. Um, the brain is what we call a, a immunoprivileged site, so the immune system spares the brain. It does not go in, it does not kill the neurons because this would be devastating for, uh, for the patient. Um, but this also means that we typically don't get rid of infections. Uh, so the long-term consequences, um, because brain infections fuel Alzheimer and other neurodegenerative diseases, uh, ah, not uh, at the moment understood. This has tremendous impacts. Yeah. And if, you, if you imagine, for example, all these young people who are now saying, oh, I, I take the risk, yeah. uh, I, I will survive if I get it. Yes, they will survive, but they might have a lifelong infection with this virus in their brain. Um, it could also have consequences that you can actually dare to ask volunteers to be infected in vaccine trials. But the biggest worry is actually for me uh, that the developing brain is affected because embryos are definitely not protected by any blood brain barrier but can improve your odds uh, as an adult. Um, but we have to look what is happening as the baby is born out of this pandemic. How can you proceed with that particular line of research? I mean, we have, we have teamed up now with neuropathologists to see uh, in uh, patient materials, whether you can actually find persistent infections. Um, we are at the moment studying uh, whether the developing brain is really sensitive, whether the, the development is derailed, because that's a big problem. Um, I mean, if, if, it is a, if it is a terrible, fatal infection, we see it instantly. But if it's more subtle, like uh, these, many of these virus infections are, uh, it could very well be that the children are born and you don't recognize anything. Um, virus infections are one of the key uh, risk factors for uh, autism, for example. And you can only diagnose this after 18 months um, or three years in a, in a child. Um, so we really have to follow up very closely and we might have need uh, really much more protective measures for pregnant women uh, in, in, uh, in this situation. It's just a flag and alert. We have not shown that this is the case, but it opens the eyes for our uh, clinical um, colleagues uh, to look for this. And in adults, I mean, you mentioned the blood-brain barrier, which would not protect embryos um, if the mother is infected. Would the 
blood-brain barrier protect adults, do you think? Um, it is not clear. Um, first thing, uh, the blood-brain barrier breaks down in major inflammatory situations like the cytokine storm, which is characteristic of severe COVID-19 infections. Uh, it also has been shown that the inner layer, the endothelium of the, of the uh, blood-brain barrier can directly be infected with the virus. Um, so it is already one step in, uh, but it really makes it through the second layer, which is formed by astrocytes and parasites. So the, uh, whether it really goes in, nobody has shown to the best of my knowledge. And we cannot say so. Our, our model is devoid of a, of a blood-brain barrier. Um, so I hope we have a very good functioning blood-brain barrier and the majority of people is not, is not seeing these infections. But uh, we have to look. Yeah, it's, that's, the, that's the big message we have. One of your scientific interests, Thomas, is in um, reducing as far as possible the use of animals in medical research. How good a model do you think these mini brains will be for, um, for example, helping to develop drugs or treatments for COVID-19 and other viral infections? I mean, you asked me how, how, how good is my baby. <laughs> no, uh, but I think quite objectively, um, you need, obviously, if, when you want to study a virus infection, if you want to have interventions uh, like, like vaccines or drugs tested, you need a lot. You need to replicate um, the virus infection, how it works. You need to have the immune response. Um, you need to see uh, how these things partition in the organism and so on. Uh, if you take a mouse, um, which would be our standard to go tool, they cannot be infected with the virus. Um, okay, then now people say we can uh, build a mouse with a human AC2 receptor and then you can infect. But where do you put the receptor? Uh, into the lung only? Then you cannot study the brain. Um, into all lung cells, there's more than 40. Um, it's not the typical infection you would get in a human. Um, if it's on, so you understand, there's a, it is very problematic to, to, to create an animal model of this. And, and the animal models we have so far seem to have at least other pathologies. And I think nobody has yet shown that uh, the macaque would have a brain infection. Yeah? So especially for these human-specific pathogens, I think uh, human organoids, uh, organs on ship type of platforms are the future. And uh, I think that's also increasing consensus that... Uh, um, modern cell culture uh, is really the way forward of, of modeling the human body. Because, as you have indicated, organoid research, not just for brains, but for many other human organoids, has made tremendous process, progress over the last 10 years, hasn't it? I mean, 10 years ago, it was a sort of infant discipline, and it's extraordinary how much how much it's been possible to convert stem cells into specific functioning human organs. It, it is incredible uh, scientific progress. Um, I mean, you have to see, uh, human cells were hardly available uh, until uh, we got stem cells. Yeah? Uh, the only accessible materials are blood and skin, perhaps. Yeah? The rest comes from diseased patients at, at surgeries, or you take a tumor and develop a cell line from a tumor, but a tumor is not an organ. And after um, years in culture, they, they look very different from, from normal cell. Um, the, then we got in 1998 uh, the embryonic stem cells, but we had all of these ethical discussions for years until in 2006 uh, only. Yamanaka um, did develop the ethically less problematic uh, induced probiotic stem cells. And since then, this is exploding. Yeah. In 2016, Francis Collins already in Congre uh, testified in the Senate, actually, for, uh, that uh, these biochips will uh, possibly have overcome animal use in drug development. Yeah. So, so the NIH from the top is already uh, really pushing this technology. And lastly, Thomas, to set the scene for our discussion to come shortly at ESOF, um, what is your reflection of the way science, and particularly medical research, has responded to COVID-19? 
you mentioned all the scientists around the world flocking into the field. Do you think it's, has that worked well or has there been too big a gold rush, a Klondike? Uh, I think it's a, it, it is an incredible success story. Yeah. I mean, you have to imagine the first cases were in December. Um, it was the 31st of December that China alerted the WHO, we have a problem. It was already on the 11th of January that the full genome of the virus was available. On the 17th of January, the first PCR outside of China was, was, uh, was published, which was then used by the WHO. We have antibody tests since March. Uh, the first drug uh, which showed clinical benefit was, uh, was accepted by the FDA uh, on 1st of May. Uh, that's unheard of, yeah. Um, but we pay a price, yeah. Um, 42,000 scientific publications. It is very difficult to be heard. Um, it is very difficult to find uh, funding uh, for the good stuff if everybody is writing who can spell uh, a COVID-19 uh, an article or a grant application. Um, we have had difficulties for work as important as ours to show the infection of the brain to get any funding for this. Because you can either work on your experiments or you can work on writing the grant applications. And if they're not really super, super well done, uh, they're just drowning in, in, the, in the thousands of applications. And then when you have performed your first set of experiments and your second and your third, each time you'll want to write it up and have it published in a peer-reviewed journal. And I know that process of finding peer review colleagues who have the time to do it is pretty clogged up, isn't it? Uh, it, is, it is really a problem, yeah. uh, Because, I mean, I'm an editor for a journal. I just had an article where I wrote to 56 colleagues trying to find a, a review and have not found a single one. Um, it's, uh, people are flooded with the, uh, um, um, with the requests of, of review. Uh, we're publishing too much. Yeah? And we're publishing too much of, of low quality. Um, it's an interesting test case now. COVID-19 wants us to respond fast and get the information out uh, because here it is a, in public interest. But uh, we have a lot of difficulties to sort out the good stuff from the bad stuff. Um, and somebody has to read these 42,000 articles yeah? and, and, and tell us what are the really meaningful ones. So I'm very much interested in evidence-based approaches, systematic reviews, quality scoring. How can, uh, can this scientific literature really be um, somehow organized that it's palatable for all of us? Well, thank you, Thomas. You've thrown out some fascinating ideas and thoughts for us to discuss now in our live discussion in Trieste. Thanks very much indeed. Looking forward to it. Thank you. And now, please, we'll have David O'Reilly's video. If I'm Clive Cookson, science editor at the Financial Times. Beautiful view over the Thames, socially distanced chat with David O'Reilly, who's the company's director of scientific research. David, we're here to talk about something that people might feel is a bit incongruous. A tobacco company carrying out a leading COVID-19 vaccine project. Tell us how that came about. Well, I can understand, Clive, why people uh, might think that. Um, but in reality, for many, many years, uh, we've been looking for alternative uses of tobacco. 
And about 10 years ago, we started working with a biotech company in Kentucky called Kentucky Bioprocessing, or KBP. And then a few years later, we bought them. In 2014, they produced a treatment for Ebola, working with a ph pharmaceutical company called uh, ZMAP Pharmaceuticals. And that was, that was given emergency use authorization by the US FDA and used by American healthcare workers during Ebola. And then we turned our attention to could we build a biologics business using tobacco as a source, of, like a factory, if you like, for biologics. And for the last four or five years, we've been working on a seasonal flu uh, vaccine with the help of the FDA. And they were very keen to work with us because the tobacco system has many advantages, we think, over conventional systems. But in this case, the speed of production is incredible. It takes about six weeks from start to finish to create a batch of quadrivalent influenza virus using our system and one week's growth in the plants themselves. So that would allow a health agency like the CDC or the FDA predict the strains that are going to come to their uh, region in September rather than the previous March, which of course will increase accuracy. So that still is underway and in fact last month we've gone into clinic in our phase one trials for our QIV candidate. But of course the real story here is in January, like a lot of other vaccine developers, uh, we saw the sequence for SARS-CoV-2 and we immediately set to work on a COVID-19 candidate and that's where we are today. We last talked about it on the 1st of April when um, you announced the project and we wrote about it in the Financial Times. Um, you were saying then, fingers crossed I think, that you hoped by June you might be in a position to make one to three million yeah. doses of the vaccine. How has it gone over the last few months? So there are two sides to that. The, the one to three million doses per month were well on target and, and are producing at that rate and we hope to ramp up our manufacturing capability further and we're talking to partners to help uh, with that around the world. On the uh, development and testing side, we've had a very successful preclinical uh, testing period. In July, we submitted uh, an investigational new drug application, an IND, uh, to the US FDA, and we're in discussion with the FDA about entering clinical trials. In the last two or three weeks, we've taken scientific advice, not just from the FDA, but from a number of other scientific and regulatory bodies working on uh, vaccines. And they've gave, gave us some interesting insights based on some of the vanguard candidates that are going through testing. And as such, we've decided to refine our approach to our clinical testing. So we're taking some time now to look at our clinical protocol. And when we're ready, and when we agree with the FDA, we will, we will enter our phase one clinical trials. And we hope that will be as soon as possible. Is there a problem in that there are so many candidate COVID-19 vaccines, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines in development, that there's a shortage of capacity and a shortage of um, clinical trial participants around the world, particularly at a time when, God willing, the um, pandemic is ebbing, at least in some places. Is, is that a constraint? It's not a constraint for us, um, and we're running our quadrivalent influenza virus trials on, on multiple sites in the US right now. So we didn't have a problem with that. We've got sites booked for our COVID uh, vaccine. I understand the general uh, concern um, that with 140 candidates now on the WHO list, and, and I believe there are many more that aren't on that list, or at least not mm. yet on that list, and there are about 28, 29 in, in clinical testing. It could become a concern, but I think really, Clive, the world needs every shot on goal it can get. You know, we hope that other candidates are successful, and certainly we're not going to be the first with our a candidate, but we hope it will be successful, and when it's ready, we're certain that there will be a need for it in, in many countries around the world. Let's talk a little more about it. Have, have you... <clears throat> published any of the preclinical work or the invest investigational work in, in, in the journal? Yes. Or is that still waiting to come out? So we, we are um, writing three papers currently on the preclinical work, which we hope to publish soon. As I said, the preclinical uh, work has gone well. We're seeing a good uh, immune response in the uh, preclinical tests, and, and we anticipate a good safety profile. And obviously we're now refining our uh, designs based on that and based on the scientific advice that we're getting uh, from uh, regulators around the world. Is this 
comparable to the um, protein subunit vaccines that are made in other ways. How, how would you put it in the spectrum? It's obviously not an adenovirus no. vaccine. It's not an mRNA or a DNA vaccine. It's not an inactivated whole virus. How, how would you put it in the spectrum, given that it's I made in plants? Yeah, I, I, I think it's unique. And um, you know, I think it's really interesting interesting in the race uh, to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic that there are so many different platforms currently being tested for SARS-CoV-2. Um, our platform is new to world. It's, it's only just gone in uh, first in humans with our QIV candidate. Um, but we think it's very different. It has some unique properties. Uh, the TMV scaffold, which is the effectively uh, the viral-like scaffold on is which that we, tobacco mosaic tobacco virus. mosaic virus in, inactivated tobacco mosaic virus on which we conjugate the uh, SARS-CoV-2 receptor binding domain antigen that in itself elicits uh, both a humoral and cellular immune response in humans um, so it, it acts almost like an adjuvant and and we will also add uh, other adjuvants um, so we think this is, um, it is unique and it has utility well beyond uh, SARS-CoV-2 and COVID. The benefits of the system, we think, is in, in plant-grown uh, biologics, but vaccines in particular, the rate of production is incredibly rapid. The plant is very good at manufacturing uh, millions and billions of copies of the, of the, uh, the, the candidate vaccine. Um, it, the plant also replicates uh, your construct incredibly uh, precisely, it's got incredibly high fidelity, which is good because that's a worry that in other systems are you making what you've programmed it to make. Um, it's good from a safety point of view because uh, the tobacco plant can't host known human pathogens, so that's one less thing uh, to worry about. And I think finally, the, the fact that our um, platform seems to be room temperature stable for six to 12 months, I think will have great utility, particularly in those countries where refrigerated supply chains are not available. And as such, we have been talking to governments in developing countries where that is a problem for them. That could be the biggest advantage of it all. It could be. I think if this appears as, let's call it a second generation yes. COVID vaccine. So without wishing to offer hostages to fortune, when, when do you think you might conclude your discussions with regulators and others and go into clinical trials with this? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to say, but we would hope within the next month or so that we'd have concluded those uh, discussions and uh, and got clearance from the FDA with a revised uh, protocol um, to then go into clinical testing. And, and we're very pleased that we've had this scientific advice. You know, nobody wants to, you know, we, we I guess we hope to go into clinic sooner, but actually not being one of the first has given us the advantage of getting the benefit of the emerging scientific knowledge on COVID. And, and as you know, the knowledge is exponential month by month. And so we're pleased to get this advice. We're pleased to be able to use it to give our candidate the best chance of success. Um, when it will be ready overall, that's, that's very difficult to say at this stage. It's early days. We'd like to see our, fir our phase one safety results and then get into phase two and three on demonstrating not just safety, but obviously efficacy. So uh, it, it, this is a marathon, I think, not a sprint. And whilst we won't be one of the first, we hope to offer the world a, you know, a safe and efficacious candidate that could be used for the long term. Given that Kentucky, Bi Kentucky Bioprocessing is a US-based subsidiary, does that mean that the initial work will be done mainly in the US? Yes, in it, all, all of the actual practical work is being done in the US, including the first uh, the clinical studies, phase one, possibly phase two. We have talked to regulators elsewhere about phase three studies, as well as, as taking scientific advice. We're also talking to governments around the world about expanding our manufacturing uh, capacity, both in the US and potentially in other countries, particularly those countries that have um, a history of plant-based um, agronomy and biotech. Um, so it's early days, but what, you know, we have this, te this technology, we have this platform which we think uh, can be interesting to the world, which has some unique advantages. And we're doing it on a not-for-profit basis, as we publicly stated. Um, so we're very open for partners that can bring something to the party, party for us, to work with us, and governments who are interested in our uh, technology. Is there any prejudice amongst 
the medical community and working with a tobacco company subsidiary on this? Not that, I'm, not that I've seen, Clive, and I, I've been pleasantly surprised with, uh, by that. All of the regulators or scientific institutes or other bodies uh, that we've spoken to, with, with being fully transparent that KBP is owned by BAT, uh, have, have not seemed to have any prejudice at all. And we, we found uh, these agencies to be incredibly positive, to be incredibly helpful. They've given us great advice that we're very grateful for. There's another quite different prejudice, at least in Europe, against genetically modified plants. Now, I know that's for food rather than medical purposes. Could that be an obstacle or not? It shouldn't be, Clive, because um, whilst effectively the tobacco plants are genetically modified with the constructs, both for the TMV scaffold and the antigen, um, we then ex purify to pharma grade both of those components. So in effect, the transformed genetically modified tobacco Maybe. plant doesn't exist in the final product. Maybe. So I'm hoping that, that won't, that mean, there'll be many prejudices, as you know, uh, in, in the whole world of, of vaccines. I don't anticipate that being a specific prejudice for our candidate. Are you aware of any other companies approaching COVID vaccines through plants? Or are you out on your own with this? No, there's another, there's another company uh, called Medicargo, and again, we wish them the, the greatest of success. Uh, they use uh, plant-based uh, vaccine technology. It's different to ours, which is good, because that gives the world two uh, different options on this. Uh, so we're, we're the two main players uh, in this area. And I think what we would hope, certainly what we as, as KBP and BAT would hope, is you know plant-based biologics is is not very well known or understood it's not well used that perhaps if we or or medicargo or others are successful in in this it may open the the eyes of the world and the scientific community in particular to look at plant-based biologics and the potential benefits that they bring uh, to the world of, of medical research and treatment and prevention are tobacco plants particularly well suited to um, biologics and medical purposes? Or is it just that you know them so well because um, you are a tobacco company and you have scientists who have been studying tobacco for decades? I, th I think, you know, fortuitously we, we do understand the tobacco okay. plant very well, as does the scientific it's, uh, community. It is the model plant, if you like. Your, um, um, but beyond that, tobacco is a very good uh, factory or vehicle for producing biologics. Uh, the entire genetic sequence is known of multiple varieties. It grows very rapidly. It has tremendously complex machinery inside it. So if we go back to the ZMAP example, that was a tripartite monoclonal antibody, and the tobacco plant was very faithful and very precise in assembling a complex biological molecule that was then used in humans. Are the tobacco plants that are used for this purpose, would they, to the lay um, person, look just like the tobacco plants growing in fields to be turned into leaf tobacco, or indeed the ornamental tobaccos that people grow yeah. in their gardens? Do, I suppose they, do they look the same? I suppose it depends how expert the viewer is. Um, <laughs> if you've got a history in, in, in botany and plant virology, I would say they look very different. Um, the, the, the variety that we use for, um, for biologic production and, and vaccine production is a relative of Nicotiana tobaccum, which is the, the species that is used in, in commercial tobacco growing or nicotinic uh, production. So it's a related species. It comes from Australasia. Um, but it's very similar to Nicotiana tobacco, uh, but it grows rapidly. It can be transfected uh, very easily, can be handled very easily. We, it's all grown indoors in, uh, in very highly controlled uh, environment and uh, is, is very good for the production of um, biologics, as I said. Let's talk about the other vaccines that you're developing on this platform. First of all, the Ebola one. Is that still being used given that there are sporadic Ebola outbreaks in Africa, or is that sort of dormant at the moment? No, it's dormant, and it wasn't a vaccine. It was a, it was a monoclonal antibody oh, yes. treatment. Yes. So um, at the time, in 2014, that was the only treatment available to the world. So that's why the FDA gave KBP emergency use authorization. And obviously time moves on. And as time moved on, uh, there were other treatments, better treatments, as you'd expect with innovation and the progression of science and technology, and ultimately a vaccine. 
So in 2015, I think it was, we stopped the production of uh, ZMAP in our tobacco-based system. That raises another question. People are developing monoclonal antibodies and antibody treatments for COVID-19. Presumably that's occurred to you. Yes, it, it has occurred, and we've looked at that. Um, you know, we're looking at multiple uses of tobacco in our research, including monoclonal antibodies and, and treatments and, and other um, you know, therapeutic proteins that you could grow in tobacco. Um, but right now, we're focusing on the vaccine. The current scale of our manufacturing suits a vaccine more than a monoclonal antibody, because you're talking microgram doses rather than milligram or, or gram-based doses. But that's not to rule it out in the future. You know, one of our ambitions long term, you know, we have this ambition in a company called A Better Tomorrow, which is to reduce the public health impact of our business. Plant-based biologics could become part of that future. And the work we're doing now in KVP could represent a future use of tobacco uh, that isn't about tobacco products like cigarettes or, or other products that people consume. The flu vaccine, you've said that's just going into phase one clinical trials. How, tell us about that and how that um, compares with other sort of candidate flu vaccines. So it, it uses um, similar antigens. As you know, there are multiple strains of seasonal flu in circulation, and most vaccines are called quad quadrivalent uh, vaccines, so they have four strains. And what that means, obviously, is the public health authorities have to predict in enough time which strains are going to come to their country. Uh, the benefit of our system is because of the rapid production public health authorities can choose the strains nearer to flu season, which increases accuracy. Um, but then you add on top of that the uh, benefit, we think, of the TAP platform, which is the tobacco mosaic virus scaffold. Um, again, in clinical testing, we've had good immune response. Uh, we've had good toxicity and safety data. But we're, and we're really anxious, of course, to see the results of our phase one uh, clinical study, because this is the first in humans of our TAP platform. You know, if we're successful, then we think this could revolutionize how public health authorities deal with seasonal flu because of accuracy um, in predictions and the rate of manufacturing. And of course, um, the other benefits such as uh, room temperature stability. That's gonna be a longer journey, I think. Um, and of course, we're very acutely aware as we do clinical studies on QIV, we don't want to compete with resources that are being used for COVID. So we're debating at the moment, do we do our phase two this winter, or would it be better to defer it, given that if there's a COVID outbreak, we don't want to utilize resources that are better used um, for treatments and vaccines and other therapies for COVID-19. Great, well, we wish you luck. And on that optimistic note, um, we're gonna time travel from London at the end of August to Trieste live on the 3rd of September. Thank you very much, David. Thank Look you, Clive, for the discussion. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Look forward to the discussion. I would it would be better to do it from here where the camera is. I think do it from here. Thank you very much. I think David um, and Thomas are with us online, but before that, um, the other da Danish David, David Buds Peterson, is going to um, give a presentation live here in Trieste. So, David, please go ahead. Thank you, Clive. And I hope you can get my uh, slides up. Yes, they're there. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to join this session, uh, not least as a uh, social scientist uh, tipping in on, uh, on uh, the vaccine debate and uh, the research behind introducing new vaccine candidates into the global health landscape. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the attitude towards uh, a possible future COVID vaccine based on data that has just been published this week. And then I'm gonna end my short intervention by highlighting a number of recommendations for science communication and health communication moving forward from here. I'm not gonna give you a lot of detail about my background. I'm a social scientist, a professor of science communication from Aalborg University in Copenhagen. And I'm also the chair of the newly founded uh, COST network on science communication in Europe, which if I have time, I will return to in a couple of minutes. Uh, first of all, and this is really my take home message for, for this morning's panel and, and my co-speakers, the, pandem the pandemic that we are witnessing right now is a communication and social crisis as much as a medical crisis. 
Um, countries such as New Zealand and Denmark, among others, uh, have used the coronavirus uh, to build public trust in experts and government's ability to respond. Other countries have uh, undermined an opportunity to build uh, public trust uh, in scientific expertise, which I'm uh, expecting will have some dire consequences also when we are now starting to talk about introducing vaccines. When people make decisions with limited or uncertain information, such as the availability and efficacy of a possible uh, novel COVID-19 vaccine candidate, trust in experts and governments and companies is extremely significant for shaping public attitudes. So it's important moving ahead from here that we are securing the trust of the authorities, of companies, and not least in experts and scientists. Without that trust, uh, it seems to be a very long and bumpy road uh, in front of us. The good news uh, is that um, three in four adults uh, globally say that they would be ready for, uh, to get a vaccine um, for COVID-19. But the good question here is, of course, is that enough? Uh, and I'm referring to data uh, that was published by the World Economic Forum uh, this week based on more than uh, 20,000 uh, respondents, out of which uh, more than 70% say that they will be willing to get a COVID-19 vaccine, but up to about 30% uh, are reporting um, that they won't. So these are, these are um, uh, remarkable numbers. Uh, China is standing out for its optimism up to uh, approximately 90% of those surveyed would expect a vaccine to be ready already uh, uh, this year or next year, while the majority of the population uh, surveyed in this, uh, in this uh, analysis will it spe expect it to be ready next year. So that's the, that's the um, belief systems that, uh, that the survey is based on. People who are uh, reluctant to take the vaccine worry, first of all, about side effects, followed also by perception of effectiveness. And I'm not expecting you to be able to read the entire graph. I will uh, provide the link for the uh, extensive report uh, which uh, have been presenting the data. But what you can see here is that in most countries, those who uh, agree that they will take the vaccine are outnumbering uh, by a quite significant marking those who disagree. But that does not mean that uh, those who disagree or the lack of trust among those uh, parts of the public is insignificant overall. Um, we also have uh, surveyed some of the reasons why this vaccine hesitancy might uh, emerge. Uh, and uh, it, of course, um, uh, is based on quite different uh, reasons in different uh, communities and in different cultures. One of the most uh, frequently cited reasons for not taking the vaccine among the hesitants um, is worry about, as I said before, side effects per and perception of uh, effectiveness and also overall lack of trust in uh, the companies and the authorities behind introducing the vaccine. But as you will be able to see if you're digging deeper into the, the data set, um, it's a quite complex picture. Overall, we are not able to take anything for granted. Uh, these are U.S. data, which is published in another recently analysis uh, by YouGov, uh, based on more than uh, 1,500 respondents, which show that there is a, a decrease um, among Americans who say that they will uh, take a COVID-19 vaccine. Unfortunately, the level of um, uh, vaccine hesitancy in the U.S. was already quite high in May when we started uh, surveying, but it has been dropping to an historic low point. Um, uh, approximately only 40% of the U.S. population in this survey report that they will be willing to take a vaccine, which is a very low number. And what this graph is also showing you is that we are witnessing a quite dynamic environment, nothing can be taken for granted. It's not a st st static situation. Things can change. So if we are not really uh, harvesting uh, the benefit of this moment and, and building trust and communicating in, a, in an engaging way, what the data we were just seeing from the um, World Economic Forum might look very differently, unfortunately, um, differently in a, in, a, in a bad way within the next couple of weeks or months. Um, here is a quote from the, from the head of, uh, of um, research at the World Economic Forum. He says here that the 26% shortfall in vaccine confidence is significant enough to compromise the effectiveness of rolling out a COVID-19 global vaccine. It's therefore critical that governments and the private sector come together to build confidence 
and ensure that manufacturing capacity meets the global supply. This will require cooperation between researchers and manufacturers and public funding arrangements that remove restrictions to vaccine access. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done there. But this is where I'm going to end my remarks, uh, Clive. I, I, do, I don't, as a social scientist, believe that, uh, e that evidence and data and clinical trials are, are enough. They are obviously extremely important, but more work needs to, to feed into the vaccine preparations. Global reports of rising fear among the public are, are quite uh, significant, as I just said. There are substantial parts of the population who are concerned about the safety of what has been labeled fast-tracked uh, vaccines. Um, obviously, once the large uh, phase three or efficacy trials deliver evidence, many researchers, including myself, uh, are speculating that a lot of the not so sure will transform into pro-vaccine um, uh, citizens. But there are also reasons to think that uh, they could move in the opposite direction, further from taking the vaccine. So nothing is really sure. I w don't want to remind this audience about the massive influx of misinformation, but there is a lot of actors out there right now who will um, take the benefit of the moment and try to exploit uh, the current uh, pandemic and the chaos it has created for their own purposes. And in order to do that, conspiracies, hoaxes, uh, and misinformation are being circulated at a level that made the WHO earlier this year declare the pandemic to be an infodemic in addition again to the health crisis. So here are some of the findings. I'm going to end my short intervention with a drawing from literature and recommendations in the, in the uh, behavioral sciences and communication research. First of all, it's extremely important to provide the science behind vaccines it's important to use clear and shareable content. It's important to reference trustworthy and independent scientific sources. If possible, in your communication moving ahead, introducing the vaccines, we have to underline scientific consensus and also be able to be honest and transparent about scientific uncertainties as they evolve. We need authentic, and humble communication that is speaking directly to citizens uh, and engaging citizens rather than passively passing on messages that people de um, uh, quite demonstrably have difficulties understanding. Pertaining to the same question, understanding the data behind vaccines, it's important with, to build strong narratives. Um, lead with facts and transparency, but also lead with good stories and uh, well made narratives. Otherwise, it will be quite uh, hard to um, bring these um, facts across. And then this pertains to a lot of the research we have been doing in Copenhagen. It's quite important to distinguish value choices and policy statements from scientific statements. So what the science says is not necessarily what policymakers do. And we have to be better at understanding the difference between the, the two of them so that if policymakers turn out not to react in the same way as many citizens would expect, this will not fall back directly on scientists. So scientists need to speak with an independent voice and uh, based on trustworthy and transparent data. Um, facts don't speak for themselves. I'm sure Clive and others can testify to that. We need good knowledge brokers and we need, we need good science communication that is not passing on information in a passive way, but engaging citizens, engaging the not so sure citizens, rather than uh, blaming them for not really understanding the facts. This is also what we are doing in the COST EU high level group on science communication. It consists of more than 50 researchers, journalists, policymakers, and representatives from EU institutions across all member states and associated countries. And for the next two years, we are compiling data and evidence to create a new research agenda for science communication in Europe, uh, among other things, with the focus on the COVID-19 context and how to produce um, high quality, evidence-based, engaging and transparent health communication for the global landscape. Thank you, Clive. Thank you, David. Fascinating stuff. It's a bit worrying, but also, I thought, reassuring about the vaccine. If 
scientists and vaccine companies handle things correctly, we, we, might, we might be all right. Let me, while I think of it, put in a plug. There's going to be a science communications session later this afternoon here at ESOF at which I'm speaking. So some of these points will be picked up. Um, I'm David O'Reilly, are you there online? If so, I'm going to ask you to respond to some of um, David Peterson's points. Um, are you worried about sort of vaccine hesitancy or more strongly anti-vaxxers putting people off um, the sort of vaccines which hopefully you'll produce? And if so, what are you doing to communicate in the way that David here is um, advocating? Yes, Clive, I think, I think it's, a, it's a concern for all vaccine developers, including ourselves. Um, I think that, as, as David was laying out, you know, the public needs uh, scientific dialogue, an honest dialogue, um, with the populations that need to receive the vaccine. I think that's the primary goal of, of governments and public health authorities. And of course, it's the, the role of the regulators that, give, that license the use of these vaccines to ensure that um, the vaccines have met the uh, appropriate um, efficacy and uh, safety standards. Uh, laid out in the, in the regulations, and then for us as vaccine developers, um, you know, we, we must publish uh, the science behind our developments and uh, the assessment, and that's what we intend to do shortly in our preclinical work. Um, but it does need, I think, uh, you know, a whole of society approach to understand um, that once a vaccine has been proved uh, safe and efficacious for use, that uh, we do need a critical mass of population to be vaccinated in order to get the virus under control. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to ask Thomas um, to respond as well, because although you're not working on vaccines, I mean, the same um, points that David made really apply to um, the wider field of research into COVID-19, don't they? I mean... Um, absolutely. Uh, my scientific mentor, Albrecht Wendel, always told me, do good things and talk about it. Um, because that's something most of the scientists shy away from the public. Mm. Um, we're pursuing a completely different approach. Uh, I have in my team a communication director. Uh, we have a Facebook page with 12,000 fans and uh, 25,000 visitors on our website because we feel that we should not only do science, but we should also inform about the science. And, and what David was presenting is one of the big concerns I'm, I'm having. I'm actually also professor of microbiology and immunology here in Hopkins, and I'm teaching vaccines. So at Triple AS uh, two years ago, I spoke exactly about the problem of uh, the unsubstantiated fear um, with these uh, with vaccinations. Um, so I think this is a key problem, um, and you might have heard the word of herd immunity which means we need to achieve a certain level of vaccination or status post-infections to really prevent these diseases. And this is a worrying fact uh, which David was presenting. But even if we don't achieve herd immunity, if the vaccines are good, even if they don't necessarily stop infection, if they um, stop you getting seriously ill, presumably um, word will get out that they are working if there are no side effects. Individuals will want to take them if they're the 74% that David um, recommends or what. D do you think that um, if one or more, and it's bound to be more vaccines, is out there, and let's be optimistic, the pitch is not ruined by uh, stories of side effects, presumably there will be a sort of rolling wave of confidence, will there? What do you think? Yes, so, so I think it's, it's important that um, we remind ourselves in, in these conversations that um, when we see numbers of 26% of, uh, being hesitant, uh, they are obviously not all hardcore anti-vaxxers or conspiracy theorists. They might just be worried families and, and people who are really trying to navigate a very complex information environment where they don't get enough information about, let's say, side effects or 
um, effectiveness. So I think a lot of the people who we see dropping out of uh, uh, some of these statistics could definitely be, be um, um, reintroduced into, into gaining trust to a, uh, to a vaccine program if we are communicating in a transparent way and, and as David O'Reilly said, if we are presenting the, the research behind it in, uh, in peer-reviewed journals that are open to the public. Um, so I think we have to think about a spectrum and there are some people, we know that from prior studies, that, that are not really, that we are not able to um, address who are just too far uh, fetched out for ever wanting to take a vaccine. But this is a very, very small minority. What's really interesting is to um, introduce the vaccine in a way that will gain trust and which will be uh, transparent about, let's say, side effects. And, and then as it goes, uh, also explain to people what are the trade-offs. Uh, part of the survey that uh, I was mentioning from YouGov is actually asking people if they would take the vaccine if it would lead to certain acceptable side effects and, and many people uh, would actually, some wouldn't. So it, it also depends on, on what type of side effects we will see and, and, and how severe they will be. Uh, if the story spreads that this is a secure vaccine and it's a robust one or, or the, the different candidates that will be on the table, I, I'm sure that we will see rising levels of uh, of um, alignment to the program, I'm sure. And another question, which I'll ask you, and then the other two um, can tackle, is to what extent do you think people are going to take, accept vaccination against COVID for purely selfish reasons, i.e. it'll stop them being um, infected or becoming ill, and to what extent is there a degree of altruism if people talk about herd immunity, being vaccinated for the good of the community? I mean, that argument has been wheeled out, for example, with measles vaccine, where you could be selfish, and if 99% of the population is vaccinated, you're extremely unlikely to get me um, measles, and you won't have the infinitesimally small risk of a side effect. To what ex what's the balance, do you think, between mm. altruism and selfishness and who gets vaccinated? This, this is a very good question, Clive, and, and it's a question that I'm not able to answer scientifically, and, and it's a question that's really hard to survey. People often who are very, who are very selfish are often reluctant to report their selfishness in, in surveys, so we, we don't really get honest answers, which, which is, is to be expected. I think also it's a question that's very, the answer of which is very dependent on how authorities and, and governments are gonna handle the next couple of months. As I start, said in, in the beginning of my intervention, um, countries like New Zealand and Denmark and, and other countries around the world have been able to build um, demonstrable public trust in the COVID response um, and what we saw there was exactly the mobilization of altruism. Uh, the argument was that we should stay home and do social distancing, uh, not out of selfish motives or out of economic motives, but out of the understanding, from the understanding that this could really hit the vulnerable uh, citizens in our societies and that we should for, in a long period of time actually, at least speaking from a Scandinavian perspective, we should limit economic growth to protect the very unproductive citizens in our societies, which was a very strong act of altruism. And I think this altruism, solidarity, uh, reinforcing social, the social contract in society and also using the behavioral incentives behind socializing and being together is something a lot of governments around the world could learn from. Um, rather, what we have seen in some countries is exactly what you're hinting at, uh, Clive, that the moment you start emphasizing selfish motives, it sort of have a performative effect where people will then start thinking about, is this something I should do for my own sake? Uh, is this something that will promote my own well-being? And in that case, I, I'm, I'm quite sure you will see a significant lower um, uh, adaptation of the vaccine. So it's a dynamic uh, question and, and a question that there cannot be one answer for, but this is really in the hands of, of the policymakers moving ahead. Right. Well, I'm getting one or two questions from people online, but um, before that, perhaps um, David O'Reilly and then Thomas, you'd like to address this question of selfishness versus altruism, either in vaccines or more broadly as um, 
David here was saying about um, isolation and so on in the context of the pandemic. Uh, David? Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, everything that David has, has just said. Uh, I don't think this is just an issue for uh, vaccine uh, adoption. I think we've seen it throughout all interventions that governments have put in. You know, the motivation of wearing the mask debate here in the UK has been very much positioned as uh, protecting yourself, but of course in reality it's as much, if not more so, to protect those around you. And I'm not a social scientist, but um, if you look at different countries, they approach this differently. So but it certainly will be an issue with uh, vaccine uptake, I think. Perhaps you'll have some people feeling that they will benefit from the herd immunity of others who've taken the vaccine and taken the, the potential risks of that. Or maybe they'll just wait and see uh, as it rolls out you know, what is happening. I'm hoping that there'll be uh, countries around the world with widespread, rapid vaccine adoption and, uh, and very few adverse events uh, noted and uh, that should give other countries uh, the confidence and other populations the confidence to get vaccinated. Thomas? I think that the vaccine suffers still from the reputation of the past when it was really a risk to take uh, some of these vaccines. Modern vaccines typically pose very little risk. Um, there's very few live vaccines which are nowadays developed and we very much hope that the COVID-19 vaccine will not be a live vaccine. Um, I also think that it's important to understand really there's a tremendous difference between the individual situation and public health. Yeah. Um, somebody who is having a very low risk um, is probably not taking necessarily the risk because we're talking here about uh, giving a medicine to people who are not ill. So why should they take at all something? Why should they, should they take the effort? And they don't understand the concept of protecting the vulnerable ones around them, those right. which cannot be vaccinated, uh, who cannot afford vaccination, or those uh, who simply don't have immune response, which is, uh, which is sufficiently strong to mount defense. So it's really important that we message this well, and uh, I, I congratulate David to his uh, presentation here. Couple of questions, David O'Reilly, for you. The first one is fairly technical. Um, I understand that before your company acquired Kentucky Bioprocessing, they had successfully worked on tra transfecting tobacco plants in fields through spraying the virus along with abrasive agents. While you today mentioned all your current work is done indoors, do you think that outdoor spraying approaches might have any value in the future? Do you have any? plans to go outside the greenhouses and into open fields? Yes, it's something that you know, we've explored in the past and, and may explore in the future. Um, you know, there's no kind of biological control issue with uh, growing tobacco plants outside. Um, you know, TMB is a ubiquitous and, and harmless virus. Um, but when you grow tobacco plants indoor in controlled conditions, the benefit really is in yield and quality of the biologic that you're producing. So when you grow it outdoors, obviously you're subject to environmental conditions, which is harder to control. So the, reason, the main reason why we do it indoors is more about yield and quality of the biologics than any need to contain um, the TMB or, or any of the biologics that we're producing. Or putting it another way, I mean, these tobacco plants are so productive that you can produce, if all works out well, presumably hundreds of millions of doses of this vaccine all indoors. Is that right? Yes, and I mean, the current facility we have, um, you know, currently we can make about one to three million doses per week, um, depending on the, the final dosage that uh, we will use. But we. We've got plans in place for governments about uh, new manufacturing facilities, expanded manufacturing facilities. It's a very scalable uh, process and not uh, too expensive. Right, okay. And the other point I uh, should um, is a very different one, and this is about, and I'll ask the other two to comment as well, about um, BAT and the tobacco company. Um, the World Health Organization has stated, as you know, the tobacco industry has an irreconcilable conflict of interest with public health. Can we discuss this, uh, David and Thomas, 
especially in light of the fact that 8 million people die of tobacco-related products every year? Is there a danger that the positive BR, PR that BAT will get from associating itself with vaccine research could make more people warm to the idea of using their deadly products? David O'Reilly, you're obviously used to getting this question, so I'm going to ask David here and Thomas to respond, and then you can have your say. So let me... Well, let me sure, go, go ahead, Thomas. No, I was not talking. So, but uh, I'm happy to do so. I mean, uh, I'm not a fan of tobacco products and as a physician in the School of Public Health and a father who died from lung cancer. But uh, I have to say, finally, something really good coming from tobacco is refreshing news. And uh, there's no sin and no saints. Um, these companies are also working on uh, replacement therapies for, uh, for smoking. Um, I'm different to many colleagues, a fan of vaping as a public health measure have been extensively uh, discussing and publishing on this. Um, there's things to be controlled, um, but uh, black and white is not adequate in any scientific area. Uh, there's no, not sinners and saints, and uh, I, I think that here a lot of high techs comes into use, which is really uh, very promising, and, and we should praise them for doing this so rightly. So, yeah, um, so I should, begin by saying that I'm not an expert in, uh, in attitudes toward, uh, towards uh, tobacco companies. Uh, I, I'm sure other people have been surveying, uh, surveying that. Uh, what I do know is that, um, it's, as I said in my own intervention, it's important here, as, as David O'Reilly also mentioned, to be extremely transparent and be, precaution, be precautious about how to communicate who are involved in the production in the, author, in, in the, in the um, uh, approval and in the distribution of the vaccine. It's a very toxic informational mix of tobacco, biotech, uh, vaccines. We know that these topics is, are something that gets people off and that uh, people are just looking for the perfect storm. So, uh, uh, and, and, and this has become an industry of distrust. And if this industry will, um, become successful in also starting to destroy some of these collaborations, which might turn out to be very beneficial for global health. We, we, we are witnessing a major uh, crisis. So it's about being very preemptive and, and not being naive about the actors involved and their legacy and the, and the history, uh, and then be open. And I think today's session is a quite good example of exactly that. Exactly, so David O'Reilly, Yes, I think it, it, look, this is an obvious uh, issue for a tobacco company to be involved in this area. But when you look at um, BAT or indeed many of the, the large tobacco companies, you know we've been moving away from cigarettes for years now, and uh, you know our vaccine development program, our biologics development program, is just a way of doing that by finding alternative uses of tobacco and, and new revenue streams. Uh, but in the core business, you know, we, we've currently converted around about 13 million cigarette smokers to potentially safer non-combustible alternatives. And by 2030, we hope to have achieved more than 50 million consumers that have quit smoking uh, using our products and ultimately moving away from uh, the dangerous combustible tobacco products altogether. Right. Another more, much more general question about vaccines. Um, someone who says, I am a researcher in vaccines, and I think there are substantial reasons for fearing a new vaccine. Don't you think there's anything to fear in relation to a new COVID vaccine? There are plenty of examples from history. For example, vaccines for swine flu in 1976 and again in 2009. Um, who'd like to, Thomas, I mean, as someone who sort of follows the fields, what would you say to this vaccine researcher who is worried? I mean, uh, there's the only vaccine uh, which is safe, completely 100% safe, is the one you don't use. Um, there's everything you apply can have some side effects. Yeah? Um, this, is, uh, this is this is a, a simple rule, but I think we have very good mechanisms first of all, to improve the safety of these things, secondly, to test the safety of these things, and then mechanisms to weigh what is recommended, what is not recommended by um, vaccine control commissions. 
And so it's, I think uh, all of this in place on the public health side, the vaccines are absolutely one of the most important health measures we can have. On an individual side, it's good there's a physician who tells you, you should, you should not perhaps uh, take it in a given uh, personal situation. Yeah. But it should not be Facebook telling you, uh, your, uh, your peers there are certainly less informed than, than the physician, physician who is treating you. David. Thanks. No, obviously I agree with uh, a lot of, or entirely with what Thomas just said, that we have to have and keep trust in, in the protocols and in the approval procedures have, that have been adopted by Western democracies and, and other countries around the world, which have turned out to be a major health advantage when it comes to, for example, uh, vaccines. And, and the same procedures should obviously apply and be reinforced in, in this case. Uh, I can understand as well, both as a researcher and, and as a private individual, why people would feel uh, insecure about a coming a vaccine candidate. There is so much information out there, uh, even governments around the world are speaking with so many different voices. Uh, some believe that we should uh, uh, enha enhance the pace, increase the pace and just get it accepted and out there immediately within the next couple of weeks a month without being able uh, to subject the vaccine candidates to the same rigorous testing as, as we normally would do. Others are much more precautious and say that we need in order both to build public trust and also to be able to secure um, compliance when, when, there is a, when, when there is a vaccine, we need to exactly reinforce the procedures that we have uh, set up and that has been in place in other vaccination programs. Otherwise, we will again see, um, I guess, some major, major problems. And then, of course, it's, uh, it's also important to say that um, we are speculating as long as we're not having a vaccine on the table and there has not been phase three testing yet, of course, this is purely futuristic speculation, which we also know from behavioral and cognitive science is kicking off a lot of anxieties. So I would expect people at this point to report anxieties. David O'Reilly, how worried are you about possible side effects? Well, I think all vaccine developers are worried about possible side effects. That's why we go through extensive uh, safety testing as well as, as efficacy testing. But I think, you know, Thomas said it that, um, you know, when we talk about safety, that there are no uh, products, certainly link pharmaceutical products, that are without any side effects for certain populations. And so we must understand that. We must publish the science that must be communicated. And then ultimately, it's the job of regulators regulators to balance the risks and the benefits mm -hmm. of any potential medicine before they uh, license it uh, for use. So I think we need to get away from this absolute safety mindset um, because very few things are. And it's the same in, uh, you know, as we're moving away from cigarette smoking. We're not claiming um, after you know, years of clinical testing even that our non-combustible uh, products which people use to quit smoking are absolutely safe. It's just that they are a lot more safer than continuing to smoke cigarettes. And I think it's true of many things in life. Mm -hmm. that need, there needs to be a dialogue on that, a discourse on it, and a wider understanding of, of what are the risks and benefits of, of doing anything. Um, thank you. Um, Thomas, a, a question for you. On the basis of what you know and what others are discovering about um, COVID in the brain, how extensive do you think it's going to be as a sort of neurological problem, the, sort of the disease and long-term effects? That's very difficult to say. I mean, first of all, um, over the last few weeks um, since we an announced our findings, uh, at least three studies have shown uh, very similar results uh, that brain cells can be infected. Uh, so I think there's no doubt about this. Um, there's also a lot of emerging mushrooming evidence that uh, you find the virus in the brain of patients under some conditions. Whether this is a widespread phenomenon, only clinical studies can show. Um, but this is something which explains a small part or a larger part of neurological symptoms. It's not clear. Because if you're very ill, you have a lot of reasons for to be impacted on the brain. Um, if you have coagulation problems like COVID is inducing, you have stroke, you have all of these microstrokes and whatever, uh, there's a lot of reasons why the brain is affected without any virus going into it. Uh, but 
the important part are really the studies to come. Um, is this a latent infection which stays with us? Uh, is this something which is affecting the embryo? These are the two big things, and um, there's only very little tiny pieces at the moment, like the virus passing the placenta, the virus found in embryos already, and, and, uh, and so on. But uh, we will only need to uh, see this from real larger epidemiological studies uh, and uh, following up on patients who had uh, COVID-19. And what are you intending to do in your own lab to follow up your own work with, with the mini-brains that we talked about in the video earlier on? Oh, our own work at the moment is to identify what are the brain cells uh, which are infected, because it seems to be a small population. Um, are these the ones which are ca carrying the ACE2 receptor? Perhaps we might be able to simply explain also what to look for, what the clinical consequences are if specific type of neurons are affected. Uh, we're working with pathologists to confirm whether this is, uh, we find the virus in patients uh, which have survived um, an infection. So this is then people who died for other reasons and later can be, uh, can be examined. Um, we're also interested exactly in these developmental processes. Um, our model is a developing brain. We start with stem cells and in three months we have mini brains which are reasonable mature but we can follow the entire spectrum of development. And we're just at the moment also talking to people who are interested in Alzheimer. Um, is this something to study in these models? Uh, can we uh, see COVID-19 as a cofactor uh, for uh, the development of Alzheimer's? So it's a big portfolio of things that, that keep us busy for the next few years. Yep. Okay. Um, Dave, David, here. Um, I don't expect you to talk in any detail about COVID in the brain, but I'm interested more Thanks. generally in your sort of views as a, a social scientist, science communications specialist, on the sort of fear factor that's grown up around um, COVID-19. What's the balance between terror and all the publicity about long haulers who suffer sure. these terrible effects and those who think that it's not likely to affect them. How, how, how do you see that balance changing? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, Clive, <clears throat> first of all, it's important that we're being specific about different audiences and the different motives. I mean, speaking about the entire population or looking at um, population-wide uh, data sets are sometimes giving a mis misrepresentation because it, it, it may actually be so that different groups have different reasons to be skeptical or fear their situation and, and, and their life conditions being um, depraved by, by COVID-19. And I think we have to address that. I mean, um, as has been said many times throughout the last couple of months, um, COVID-19 is, um, is making much more visible the inequalities in our society. Um, it is not hitting people uh, the same way uh, across socioeconomic um, factors and, and this is obviously something we have to address because uh, there are long-term uh, impacts to be expected uh, both for people um, who are vulnerable to the, to the, to the disease and, and also for probably for, for, uh, for vaccine uh, hesitancy to see can we, can we change this around and, and reduce fear. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that you know, Clive, to, to really reduce fear in and of itself is the, is the right strategy. Um, we, we cannot make people comfortable about scientific details um, in and of themselves. Uh, we really need to communicate it and, and also engage people to, to increase their understanding and build stronger narratives. For example, around the altruistic argument you yourself mentioned uh, half an hour ago. I think this is the way we are slowly starting to embed the pandemic into our value system and understanding that we need to um, handle and address the very difficult choices we are confronted with based on our values and the combination of values and scientific facts I think will, will uh, get us a long uh, way um, together and, and so my, my, my long answer here is that there is no uh, shortcut 
um, to reduce uh, fear. I think one thing that I have myself been noticing and been quite disappointed about is really the lack of interdisciplinary uh, research in this area. We have uh, been modeling um, the disease spreading from uh, epidemiologists sitting around the world and, and creating very, very um, sophisticated data models, but often without the inputs of social and behavioral researchers who knows what it is like to create trustworthy communication, who knows much more about levels of compliance and behavioral change which I myself believe could uh, sophisticate a lot of the models. And the same goes for governments. If you really want to reduce fear, you have to understand the behavior and the cognitive dimensions behind those reactions rather than just um, abandoning it as a conspiracy or people being crazy. Yes, I agree totally. Um, what about the rush of scientists into COVID research. Thomas mentioned that in the introductory video. Um, during the session in this hall earlier on, Helga Novotny, the former European Research Council president, was saying, was lamenting the way there was an uncoordinated rush of um, research not interdisciplinary enough, far too many scientific papers, many tens of thousands, crisis in peer review, people, um, journal editors can't get people to review their papers, the authors can't, so they're rushing them out on preprint servers, med archive, bio archive, quality control is suffering. Um, I'm going to ask our two scientists um, who are remotely present what they make of it all. David, as a research director, are you, have you been disturbed by what you've seen? Obviously, there have been great research coming out, but there's also been a sort of slightly uncoordinated downside. How, how would you see it fitting together? Yeah, I think you have to, in the round, on the, on the one hand, um, you know, it, it's a global pandemic, and the world's entire scientific firepower was, was directed upon it, which is a good thing. Um, of course, that was done under the, you know, the huge anxiety and the lack of knowledge at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but yes, we struggled to monitor the scientific literature and um, to make sense of um, you know, what's good and what's not, particularly when most of the papers you're looking at at any one time are in, in pre-publication or pre-peer review, and even those that have gone through peer review, you know, it's, it's been challenging for the journals uh, adequately. I think it's going to take some time to sift out uh, the good science from the not so good science and start to draw you know, firm conclusions which we as a global scientific community and indeed governments and others can act upon to guide the intervention that will get us through this crisis. How do you evaluate them, the ones that matter to you, the ones that have not been peer-reviewed? I mean, there's obviously a sort of internal peer review you can give them. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's it, Clive. You know, obviously, we have a substantial scientific firepower ourselves. So I have epidemiologists, I have virologists, I have medics, and uh, it's that internal peer review. We, we meet every week to go through the scientific literature, and uh, you know, we sift through the ones that we think are of value, that are good quality um, pieces of research that have been you know, articulated well in the papers, and we use that to inform us, not just on vaccine development, but other uh, COVID interventions that we're involved in, and indeed the impact on our, on our core business. But it, it is that internal peer review which has been a lifesaver you know, for me as the scientific research director of this company. Thomas, how do you make sense of it all? Because you're covering a very wide area because, as you said, you have wide-ranging research interests. How can you possibly follow what's going on and evaluate it? No, no I can't. Uh, the big risk is, like everybody does, uh, what you're citing and what you're using is what fits your own theory and what was written by your friends. Uh, that's, that's a very big concern. Uh, but I think, in, especially in this situation, um, as we saw, there was no alternative to doing so. Um, because we cannot 
stand as scientists outside of the society who now desperately needs answers and needs solutions, which are scientific solutions in, to a large extent. And uh, we have to communicate this quickly. Uh, it was a fascinating development for me that suddenly everything around COVID-19 became open access in literature, uh, something we have been struggling with with many of the, um, of, of the publishers before. But when it's really important, they agree open access is the solution. Um, I think there is at the moment um, not enough mechanisms really to weed the good and the bad things. Uh, I have a chair for um, evidence-based toxicology and uh, this is a toolbox of things, systematic reviews, quality scoring, risk of bias analysis, meta-analysis uh, type of work, which is the way to sort scientific literature. Um, but this is still in its infancy in almost all preclinical areas. Um, but I think that's the future. We need these. But these are slow processes. This is nothing where you could answer to COVID-19 and say, yeah, we wait for the systematic review before we decide on something. But, um, but that's, that's the way forward from my point of view. But in the short term, how can we deal with the sort of peer review crisis that we, you and I have talked about? privately. Encourage um, publications which are um, including reproducibility aspects, which are, um, which are uh, of high quality, publish less, but of, of better quality. Um, at the moment, we have far too much uh, incentive for publishing a lot with relatively small increments of knowledge. Uh, some people call it the least publishable unit, um, which is a sick development. Um, so we really need to encourage things which are, which are good and unfortunately sometimes you have to follow the advice of the, uh, of the gurus in the field. You have to see what these people are saying, what they are citing, what they are condensing from the literature. Um, it is not a perfect system, it is eminent based, eminence based, not evidence based, but um, there's a good reason why they are called experts. Yeah? David Peterson, the countdown clock is showing two minutes to go. Right. So I'm going to ask you to sort of answer this and give a quick roundup of where you think this fascinating discussion has gone. Thanks, yeah. No, we, co we covered quite a lot of ground this, uh, this morning, Clive. Um, I think we are witnessing, um, as also Thomas was saying or indicating, kind of a paradox. At the same time, we really want scientists to hurry up to um, really contribute to a solution and to deliver new scientific results that can help societies address this uh, unprecedented crisis. But at the same time, as I mentioned throughout the morning, we also need to reinsure trust in the procedures and the protocols that we have in place. This is both the case for vaccine approvals, but it's definitely also the case for the scientific machinery. So peer review and open publications, quality assurance, to getting the research right, and as Thomas rightly said, not incentivizing bad behavior. And with that, I don't mean individually bad behavior, but systemic bad behavior, uh, inflating your research results, putting fancy titles on your research papers uh, in an attempt to maximize your citations is not the way forward. And I do think we have a crisis also when it comes to preprints. Um, we, we cannot really live without them, but they are also very uh, tough to live with because a lot of stuff is being circulated and some of it is being picked up early phase and turns out to be very crucial uh, even before the research went through peer review. But at the same time, it's also creating the risk of data contamination and of derailing uh, the response capacity of uh, public authorities around the world. So I would sum up this session, Clive, by saying uh, something that is hopefully not too uh, new or novel, actually, but that we really need to ensure trust and transparency um, throughout the entire food chain of research from the laboratories to policy advice, to medical trials and uh, vaccine approval, and the communication of facts, uncertainties uh, th through the population and through the media. I think that value chain of food chain of, of science uh, communication and public impact of research 
is what I would take home as our key message today, Clive. Thank you. That's a great key message, a great final note. Um, many, many thanks to the three of you. Also, I want to thank my friend Aidan Gilligan of SciComm, who put the wonderful videos together, a lot of work, and to organize the session. It's been so worthwhile, Aidan, so thank you. The, um, David and um, Thomas prepared some slides, some of which appeared in the videos, but the slides themselves will also be available on YouTube if you wish to look at them. So thank you all very much. Much enjoyed by me and I hope everyone else. Thanks. Thanks.